Hello and good evening to our audience in Hong Kong and APAC, and good morning and good afternoon to our audience overseas. Welcome to Our Power Hong Kong and Invest Hong Kong webinar, Why Do Our Business in Hong Kong? Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Doris Fong, Head of Creative Industries of Invest Hong Kong, which is a government department in Hong Kong that facilitates foreign business to grow and expand the business in our region and in Hong Kong. We are delighted to be the supporting partner of Our Power Hong Kong campaign. And in the next few minutes, I'm pleased to give you a very brief introduction about the art scene in Hong Kong before we start our panel discussion. So if you allow me to share my screen, Okay, all right. Um, I'll start by the vibrant art districts in Hong Kong. The art ecosystem in Hong Kong has developed rapidly over the last decade. Exciting art districts has grown organically in Hong Kong around Central, Soho, Shen Wan, and Sain Kuen area. Another major clusters that has grown rapidly is the South Island Cultural District in Kupang and Aberdeen. Located in the southern part of Hong Kong Island, it comprises around 15 to 20 local international art galleries and artist studios in warehouse-sized industrial buildings. There are major government initiatives in developing art and culture in Hong Kong. One of them is the West Kowloon Cultural District, which is a 40 hectare waterfront site that encompasses a variety of art and cultural facilities, including the Mega Museum M Plus, which our speaker Sohania will tell you more about it later on. And there is also the Museum of Art, which was reopened in 2019 after major renovation, now with much bigger exhibition space. And Hong Kong is one of the largest art markets in auction sales. The annual art fair calendar continues to strive with international art fairs like Art Basel and Art Central, both happening in March. We also have affordable art fair and fine art Asia. And of course this year, because of the pandemic, major art fairs like Art Basel has gone virtual, but with very interesting online viewing rooms and exhibitions. <laughs> on Other favorable factors that make Hong Kong an attractive place to do art business are the simple and low tax structure with no sales tax or import export taxes, and the high concentration of high net worth individuals. Hong Kong has one of the world's most efficient transport and art logistics network and world-class international airport providing easy access to regional markets. All these are factors contributing to Hong Kong being one of the world's largest art markets and attracting international galleries, auction houses to choose Hong Kong as the base to expand the Asian market. In the past decade, Invest Hong Kong has supported many art business to grow and expand in Asia via Hong Kong, for example, art galleries and art auction houses as well. I'm sure you will learn more about Hong Kong's advantage in conducting art business from our speakers today. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Professor Derek Collins, Dean of the Faculty of Arts of University of Hong Kong. Over to you, Professor Collins. Hey, thank you, Doris, and thank you, Invest Hong Kong and Art Power and all of our friends who've uh, made today's session possible. I'm delighted to join you all today. We have a global audience. We have uh, members uh, watching, visitors, viewers watching from, uh, from Europe, from North America, and certainly here in Hong Kong and elsewhere in Asia. So we're delighted everyone can be with us today. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk in more depth about um, uh, Hong Kong's continued importance as a leading um, a hub of art in Asia. We're gonna look at what makes Hong Kong an attractive place to develop art businesses and why international players continue to invest in Hong Kong and, and a host of other issues that I hope uh, we have time uh, to get to. What we'll do is we'll start, uh, I'll introduce the panelists, we'll start a discussion. I will take questions from the audience, but we'll try and reserve those toward the end. Uh, maybe, maybe about two thirds of the way through, we can uh, shift gears and begin to take questions from the audience. So be thinking about things that you'd like to ask our panelists. We have a wonderful uh, group of panelists with us today. Uh, we have Sahania Rafael, who is the museum director of M Plus. Um, you might say M Plus will be Asia's most important new museum of contemporary visual culture. It will bring together art and design and architecture and moving image of the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, Sahania has 
30 years or more of museum management experience and vast knowledge of contemporary art and art in the Asia Pacific region in particular. And before coming uh, to Hong Kong uh, several years ago now, she held positions in Sydney um, at the Gallery of New South Wales and before that in, in Brisbane at the Queensland Art Gallery. Next, we have um, Jonathan Crockett. He is Chairman Asia and Head of 20th Century and Contemporary Art Asia at Phillips, Phillips Auctioneers. With over 20 years of experience in the field, Jonathan has worked at Christie's and then he's run his own art advisory business. And then he headed to Sotheby's in London to become a director and senior specialist of contemporary Asian art before coming to Hong Kong. Uh, Jonathan also brings uh, just a wealth of, uh, of, of experience uh, throughout Asia uh, to his position at uh, Philips. And finally, we have uh, Brett Gorvey, founder and director of uh, Levy Gorvey. Um, Levy Gorvey is a gallery with spaces in London, New York, and about a year and a half ago, they opened in Hong Kong. And uh, with the aim of making their Hong Kong gallery uh, a kind of a sort of equivalent third arm of their New York, and their London galleries. Before forming Levy, uh, Levy Gorvey uh, with Dominique Levy, Brett was chair of post-war and contemporary art department at Christie's. He spent many years at Christie's going back to the mid 90s and he also has even before that a very interesting background in art journalism. So we have between our three panelists many many years of experience and um, we welcome them uh, today. So the first topic, just to jump right in, and, and uh, whoever would like to respond first is fine. Let's talk a little bit about the art ecosystem in Hong Kong. What makes it so unique and full of opportunity? And maybe, Sahanya, you could start if you like. Sure. Um, thank you, Derek, and thank you to Art Power Hong Kong to, for putting this panel together. Very happy to participate really because I've been coming to Hong Kong since the early 90s and have watched this city transform and the, and the um, speed in which that's happened but also the texture of the art community in Hong Kong on, on whose shoulders we all um, make our work happen. Um, what makes this ecosystem so unique and full of opportunity? It's been expansive and expanding at a, a speed that's phenomenal. Um, coming into Hong Kong and into mainland China, watching the growth of contemporary Chinese art, the design and architecture cultures, the film cultures, it's so rich. And on top of that, watching the development of market um, and a market that's been incredibly powerful in the world, and then seeing the need for museum. For me, coming into M plus is essential that we start thinking about um, our communities, a museum's civic role in uh, building communities, the role M plus will play as a, as a major global institution already uh, sustaining that voice in the community. And I think um, the opportunity is that there is such a strong audience here. And by what I mean by here is I mean in Hong Kong, but also in the region. We, we are without question a hub where people come in and out. We're in you know, seven and a half million city, but we know when business as usual is happening, we have 80 million come into this city. Um, of course, that's not the case now with the virus, but there's no other city that welcomes that kind of visitor in, in, into, into what is now a really building a, a sense of a cultural capital, a cultural ecosystem, and the interrelationships that we all um, must undertake is, is, about, is, is about that opportunity. And I, I feel extremely um, strongly about the fact that we need to have um, in Asia, a museum of equivalence to whether it's MoMA in New York or the Pompidou in Paris. Because it's what, when you have institutions, civic museum collecting institutions of scale, that you start to really understand um, the balance around which value is understood, art histories, design histories, architectural histories are also expanded upon. Yeah, fantastic. Jonathan. Um, Derek, 
it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this, to the, this discussion. Uh, to come to your, your uh, question, um, what's so unique about um, the ecosystem here? Well, essentially, there's nowhere else in the world like Hong Kong um, where it has this uh, unique mix of um, cultural heritage, which is informed by its mixed um, you know, history, um, uh, given the you know the um, eastern and western influences here, um, it's a place where the history of art collecting has existed for over a hundred years um, since Hong Kong was first founded. Yet, where exposure to international post-war contemporary art has been very limited until very recently. Um, despite that, there is a huge thirst for art knowledge, art appreciation here in Hong Kong. Um, and this is a city um, with, well, by some reckoning, uh, some calculations, it has more billionaires here than any other city in the world. Despite this huge concentration of wealth here, though, um, as of yet, um, it doesn't yet have a world-class contemporary art museum. Of course, this will change very soon with the opening of M+. But when one consider, considers other, you know, um, concentrations of, of wealth around the world in the form of great cities like New York, London, Paris, there is almost a museum on every block. Um, so as a result, people here in Hong Kong um, have to travel to see the art um, or attend the next best thing, which is to you know, come to the auction previews where highlights of uh, auctions in London or New York are being um, shown um, or perhaps attend the um, commercial gallery shows here. Um, when it comes to the auction market in particular, um, you know, we've, we've, especially at Phillips, we've, we've seen a lot of Western contemporary art which we've been introducing uh, to our sales here in Hong Kong and there is an ever increasing demand for um, Western contemporary art with our uh, clients here in Hong Kong and across Asia. So there's absolutely a huge opportunity here and um, you know, the, the more Western artists we bring out, I mean, we, we, we act in, in fact um, continue to break world records here in Hong Kong. Um, and I've got quite a good example. I mean, last, uh, in t a good example in terms of how global the taste is here. Um, last July, when we had our, our, our 20th century contemporary art sale here um, in Hong Kong, we set world records for Daniel Arshin, Jenny Figus, Claire Tabaret, Mad Saki, and Maria Taniguchi. These are um, American, uh, Irish, French, Japanese, and Filipino artists. So it's a truly global um, taste that the, that the collectors have here on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, and when the museum, when M Plus opens, you know, and, and exposure to Western contemporary art um, uh, uh, grows as a result, so too will the market grow and, and continue to flourish. So that's particularly exciting. Yeah, I think that is really exciting. Uh, Brett, do you want to uh, you want to comment from the perspective of a? Well, yes, I mean, as a gallerist uh, and a previous auction house person, I mean, for us, when we uh, created our gallery, uh, the first initiative, as you described, was how do we create a third pillar to our business? We had New York, we had uh, Europe, and specifically galleries in London, and. Hong Kong was not only essential, it was an obvious uh, position for us, uh, not only because, as uh, my fellow uh, uh, panelists have said, it's the appetite as well as this extraordinary mix of this ability, basically, of bringing both West and East together in one place. And uh, we've all referred to both the appetite, but it, it is this optimism, and specifically, I think it's the speed, you know, the learning curve that we've experienced uh, with collectors and clients. We often talk, you know, we meet a buyer and the buyer becomes a collector. That's really the aim for all of us. And again, if we look at it, you know, again, I think we all feel that the, the presence of a, of a major museum is essential for that ecosystem. We all rely on each other. I mean, what's wonderful about this panel is, you know, there is not, you know, normally you would see a certain degree of uh, competition between between the gallery world and the auction world, potentially with the museum world as well. But I think in Hong Kong especially, there is this generosity of spirit. Mm. 
uh, that has allowed for this very, very quick growth. And I think we all rely on each other, but at the same time, there is this independence in the way that we have approached ourselves. And I think this is what's so exciting. And despite the rioting, despite the, uh, the COVID situation, we have continued to not only invest very heavily within uh, the region, but commit ourselves even greater. And I think it is this optimism in, in the belief that not only is there an appetite and, and a hunger, but there is an audience that is actually uh, far advanced in many ways than, uh, than their counterparts in other countries. So let, let's just follow on uh, that point for just a moment. I mean, I'd like you to speak a little bit more about where we are on the learning curve. As Jonathan said, and as you've said both, it, of course, there's an appetite. There are billionaire collectors. There are very sophisticated collectors here in Hong Kong. There's also a spectrum, I think, of interested potential museum goers, interested, um, you know, potential gallery viewers and ultimately collectors. But there's a group of people with quite a bit of disposable income in Hong Kong that still aren't quite sure how to, na how to navigate the art world. So I'm not talking about your most sophisticated uh, clients. I'm talking about what I sense to be quite a large group of people who are very interested in the museum world, very interested in the gallery world, the auction world, and whatever. Where, where, where would you say we are on that learning curve as a, as a, as a city? And yeah. how do we... First of all, if we look at the, the contribution of Asia as, a, as an entity, as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a unit in terms of the, uh, the art world, you know, if you look at the, the successes at auction, we often see between 20, 25% of the buying uh, coming from Asia and predominantly, whether it's Hong Kong or from China, it is ultimately uh, coming from, from that particular area. Now that growth has been consistent. And if, if ultimately, as I mentioned before, you know, my time at Christie's, but also now, uh, we are seeing consistent growth. And actually what's very interesting is actually the age group, hmm. because we're dealing here with a much younger uh, uh, a uh, group of uh, potential buyers and collectors, then potentially we will see in America or, 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 or Europe. And that's partly to do with wealth. It's to do with, you know, at what point people are actually comfortable, uh, uh, you know, expending uh, on art because they've actually now reached a certain point in, in their own uh, um, comfort zone in terms of wealth. But we are seeing specifically in Asia, uh, collectors in their 30s, for instance, and young 20s. And I think that also defines the type of art that they're responding to and the technology uh, and the ease of technology at which the access to this art is, is available. Can I just jump in at this point and say yeah. the other aspect of this is that there are um, very, very interesting and I mean, part of the contribution to the market are the work of artists and makers from Asia and from Hong Kong, like a very significant um, uh, part of the that energy and the excitement was about contemporary Chinese art and the art that came from this region, Japanese, Korean, Filipino. And um, to be able to then contextualize that within an international museum context is also to invite and develop audiences and to develop a more mature um, ecosystem around audience and knowledge. And so for the museum, the work is about informed audience space, developing that at slow, consistent core business for museum. And when um, M plus opens to be able to show the, you know, the Asian story from our point of view, together with key international artists and artworks is going to make such a big difference to what you were just saying, but the young audience, we've already seen that uh, in the work that we've done at the pavilion and with our programming, there's no question that the 50% uh, of our audience is from the age of 20 to 40. And that's an incredible demographic for a museum to already know we are tapping into and they are very keen. That's like a, a, a very important part of the work that we're doing is also acknowledging the great creative content that's come out of this region that often is you know part of a diversity story in the international space of europe and america but it's core to our story from here and i think that's incredibly important because I, I think you know there's always that tendency to look to the west and to believe somehow that you know our job as gatherers uh, has been to bring western art into this region for me 
B, this is basically a two-way street. It's a conversation that is continually happening. I mean, our team in, in Asia is run by an Asian-led uh, team. I mean, it's basically, we are the outsiders in a certain way. And it is this understanding that this phenomenal culture, phenomenal artists, and it is about contextualizing, as you described, creating, uh, actually allowing people to see really, you know, full spectrum. And I think that's ultimately when, whether it's the art fair, which again is a phenomenal aspect, the Basel Art Fair, uh, if we see the growth, you know, if you go back Derek, to what you were talking about in terms of how we've seen incremental growth, every year the art fair, that the expanse of that as a public forum, and you know, this is one of the, in fact, I think it is the only art fair in the world that is sold out. You know, you have lines around the block, basically for people just to come and see the art. And I think that openness, that accessibility that uh, is available from these platforms, but it's, it's actually the openness of the of the uh, the visitor uh, coming to view and being as open, coming with potentially the knowledge of um, of their own artists, but finding basically that synergy and, and that ability to basically see a global audience or glo global world through the art world. Jonathan, do you want to? Yeah, no, I, 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 um, to compound on what um, both Brett and Suhanya just said, um, there's, there's a huge thirst here, uh, particularly among the younger generation, people in their typically 20s or 30s who are probably, when it comes to buying it, uh, and selling art at least, um, well, mainly on the buying side actually, at auction, uh, mainly second generation wealthy Chinese, um, often who themselves as individuals have little or almost no uh, experience of buying art themselves. That said, um, quite often they are second generation and the, um, you know, the first generation, the, the, the generation that created the wealth in the first place, are people who have collected art, but only it's been a different type of art. It's been Chinese ceramics, works of art, Chinese ink painting. Um, and if you kind of contextualize the kind of history of art collecting here in Hong Kong, people often overlook the fact that, you know, China has the longest surviving culture and civilization globally. Um, it um, has been, you know, there's, a, there's been a long history of collecting art and appreciating art for hundreds of years, more than a thousand years. Um, and um, that said, you know, the, the focus has always been on, on, on Chinese art. Um, it's been looking internally. It's only, it's only been in the last, you know, bar a few exceptions, um, it's only been the last you know, decade or two decades where, um, you know, we've seen this exponential growth um, in interest uh, for, or, 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 or in um, Western contemporary art, post-war modern art. Um, and during this time, um, there's been a huge influx of um, commercial galleries, um, you know, the art fair, Art Hong Kong, which then became Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, to, 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 to Brett's point about, you know, growth being consistent, I would actually say that the growth has been, has been exponential. People here, are, yeah. you know, are just becoming more and more and more interested in, 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 in Western art. Um, and their interest, the growing interest kind of coincides with the, the advancement of um, digital technology, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world these days, you can access um, uh, anything at the, at, you know, at the tip of your fingertips on, on, your, on your phone. Um, and quite often what we see here um, is that you know, there is this thirst of knowledge, um, there's this demand for learning about the art, um, and people here are extremely well read, they're very well informed, um, you know, they're, they're just as likely to, to know about a, a young emerging Swiss contemporary artist um, in Beijing, for example, than, than, than they are, than, than someone of the equivalent age um, in Zurich might be, for example. So um, I would say that um, this is a market which, art market, which is, yes, it's, it's been, it's, it's got a long history, but it's, it's developing in a way, maturing in a way, which, um, you know, it's becoming more globalized, um, and really, you know, we're just scratching at the tip of the iceberg. This is just the beginning um, in terms of the potential for the market here. I do think that it's also about that cosmopolitan spirit, you know, that Hong Kong has. 
and the the relationship of that internationalism within Hong Kong's spirits is um, amplified in in that kind of in, in whether it's the Art Basel context or even now with the museum. And it's very important that that idea of connection is expressed in the various um, parts right. of the work that we do. I completely agree. And I think this has got a lot to do with contemporary culture. Um, you know, Chinese people here in Hong Kong uh, and, and beyond in Greater China are you know, exposed to Western culture, whether it is uh, from personal life experience, they've studied abroad, they've worked abroad, they've come back to Hong Kong, um, or via social media or um, you know, videos or cinema, a film. Um, you know, um, they're, they're aspiring to a Western lifestyle, which um, is completely foreign to um, the lifestyle of, of um, the, the, the culture here in Hong Kong. And I think education, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, I think education here is so highly prized. And I think that's something which, again, uh, is, is a driving force, not just in the way that we're talking about uh, collectors, you know, assembling information and, and basically making it own. And, you know, I always find, again, we talk about, uh, uh, in, you know, education on one side, but it's also uh, how people are doing business. I mean, the speed of understanding and the complexities of the art world and becoming part of it and becoming major players is also a fascinating to, uh, aspect of this. But it is this, not just the sophistication that you're describing, but also this, you know, the respect given to education. And if I look at our role as a gallerist, and I see it the same with the auction houses and obviously as with M+, it is this very strong role of educators, of bringing not just the art to the, to the region, but bring the information and bringing basically the context, which again will allow, you know, for, 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 for the growth of, of, of even greater uh, potential. This is really interesting. I wanted to press a little bit because, you know, people have said that Hong Kong, well, to, to the extent that the market is driving interest, right? The, 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 you know, obviously high prices and all sorts of things. I mean, to, to the extent that that's driving um, increased interest in art, there's also this issue about whether Hong Kong is just modeling itself after a New York or a London, or whether it is actually, as you've touched on the cosmopolitanism and the emphasis on education here, maybe it's actually beginning to sort of um, forge something different, something new, something unique in Asia. I mean, this would go toward the question that we we're gonna talk about later about Hong Kong as, a, as an arts hub, but could you speak to that a little bit? I mean, it does have a unique it, it, it should have a unique quality and character to it, right? It's an opportunity, it would be, not to just define themselves in the view or in the mirror, so to speak, of New York or London or Paris, but really to think about what, 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 what's unique about this region and what's unique about, you know, the collectors and the viewers and the museum goers here uh, that therefore creates a different experience. It, it's, it's something that we want to draw the world into, but we want to be clear about what it is they're getting It's different here, right? It's not, they're not just, buying another piece of art in Hong Kong because there's no taxes, right? I mean, we want there to be more to it than that. Definitely. I mean, from yeah. the M plus point of view, I think the fact that we're a visual culture museum, first and foremost, recognizes within Hong Kong how rich the visual cultural space is in this city. And it's from that root that the museum was dreamed by the the a first group of the museum advisory committee, you know, in 20, 20, 15 years ago. So it's um, understanding that richness in within Hong Kong. But for us, the big um, challenge is to reach to the great big um, population of Hong Kong, that 7 million that, that are here, of which we know, you know, say six and a half million are not yet understanding the power of institution and power of culture and visual culture and art. So that's the opportunity, but that is also hard work and deep work that we need to do to get into, into the imagination of our community. But as Brett said, education has always been um, valued. And as Jonathan has pointed out, a deep history of collecting and literati uh, value in in cultural um, life is a basis on which to develop. 
I think one of the mistakes that, if I look at, again, the, the growth of the gallery system uh, within Hong Kong, I think the initial step, and you know, the auction houses, I'm sure, were also part of this, was really just trying to replicate, as you described, Eric, of basically what we do in New York or what we do in, in, in Europe. And it is understanding that, in fact, what we are creating, what is being created in, in, in Hong Kong, in Asia, is unique. It is unique in terms of this cross-fertilization between Eastern ideas and, and Western ideas. It is this hub of activity. It is this entrepreneurial uh, um, aspect in terms of the character of the personalities as well. So certainly when we approach any idea that we're looking at in terms of Hong Kong, it is unique. It is not trying to just bring whatever we're doing in, in other regions. It's really thinking about what is ultimately the character of the personalities there the, you know, and how do we actually move the pendulum? Because I think we're all part of that idea that we are at a sort of ground level. You know, there is, you know, we're talking about millennials of, of history, but there is that feeling and, and frankly, part of the excitement and the optimism is that we are at the, the beginning of something great. So speaking of millennials and younger people, I want to come to technology. You've, you've touched on this in various ways. Technology is, um, has made a huge impact in the art world and continues to make one. It's not just that people are using more online uh, platforms of one kind or another. I mean, there's online auctions, there's online only sales, and it just kind of goes on and on. But even if we include social media in that, the way Instagram is being used by individual artists, by galleries, by auction houses uh, themselves to attract new uh, new business. Jonathan, I know you have some experience your, yourself quite famously uh, with, with Instagram attracting new buyers. But I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm really interested in how this is going to continue to play a role, uh, maybe from the point of view of education, but certainly from the point of view of engagement. How do you think about the impact of technology on the art world from your different perspectives? There's, there's um, you know, as I say, it's really, uh, there, there are many, many aspects of this, but, but just maybe take it apart however you like. But how do you think about technology, its role? What are your plans, maybe, you'd like to speak about, too, in the future? How, how you might implement technology, even in ways maybe you're not doing yet? But, but give, give us a sense of that, because this is a huge area. And as you say, the demographics here in Hong Kong suggest that, um, that online purchases are actually probably a significant portion of the, the, the sort of sales happening in Asia here. I mean, in other words, there's a real demand, a real interest and hunger for online um, access points for, for the I mean, It was very interesting to see, to your point, that in the most recent auctions uh, that Sotheby's held, um, the, there was a Francis Bacon painting that sold in the $86 million price point. It was bid on by an online bidder coming from Asia. A Jean-Michel Basquiat work on paper selling at $15 million was bought by an online bidder from Asia. So again, we are really seeing this as being really Asia leading the field and using these new technologies to their benefit. And I think that's something which, again, it wasn't even a surprise for us. It was something which actually we recognized as being part of the characteristic of what we see. Yeah, and the, the, I mean, this is this is something which is you know it's been developing over the past few years, but it's been kind of accelerated in the last few months because of um, you know um, COVID nineteen. Um, we are seeing um, we've seen a huge amount of um, activity coming in the last few months um, in terms of client interaction with us digitally um, compared with you know, last year and and, and going back. Um, to the extent that you know, we've had, um, well, we've had, we've been forced to change our, 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 our the way how we you know, interact with our clients, um, and clients, you know, instead of being able to come in and see us physically, we're asked going, flying to go and see them. Um, you know, they've resorted to, and we have resorted to, uh, interacting with them digitally, whether it's on, you know, on the phone, um, in a Zoom conversation like this. Um, WhatsApp, WeChat, Instagram chat, wh whatever it might be, um, you know, it's happening a lot more now digitally. Um, and um, are we prepared for this? I mean, does more work have to be done to really make the best use of this technology? I think, well, interestingly just, enough, sorry to interrupt because I think it, it, it's funny how, uh, I think this is, already, you know, we've been developing this as a gallery and I think the auction house is there. And I think one of the reasons why it's been so swift because of, I mean, COVID has accelerated everything, but ultimately that, that shift 
which happened for us in March. Uh, and it wasn't just the fact that we had the, uh, the technology was there and actually we were using it and you know, the art fairs have moved completely into a virtual world. It was the fact that actually the consumer was used to it. It was actually, you know, if I look at the older generation and try to teach people how to use Zoom, that's, that's been the sort of joke of, of, of this kind of moment. But to see on the other side, how quickly um, uh, technology has been part of the language, actually. And, and, you know, it's partly that notion of access. How do you ultimately get this huge amount of information that's basically circulating at all, at all times? And I think, first of all, the younger generation obviously has a, an ability and, a, and a, you know, a, a comfort zone in working with that. But certainly the industry has been directing this, certainly in the last 10 years, towards digital and how do we use this technology. And I, I, again, from the museum world, it's a similar thing. If you watch ultimately what's happened under COVID, you can go to most museums still uh, and go into sort of a virtual uh, reality of those museums. But there has been a continuation. And in fact, one of the most amazing things about this COVID period, you know, we, we have only, it's really been in the last two weeks where we've actually had to go into shutdown in Hong Kong. We've ultimately been able to remain open, you know, and compared to galleries in New York or in London or in Europe, we've been able, able to basically continue ourselves throughout this whole process. And it is in conjunction with an online presence. I would add that, you know, it's, it's just to take a little step back, that it was in Asia that big communities became, um, you know, started to be digitally alert. So very, very early in Korea, in mainland China, in, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. So to see um, this step into that world is a most, it's absolutely natural. How we in our various institutions respond and think about what is the digital relationship? I think, you know, with the COVID situation, I've watched many, many museums do lots of things online. And, and I think there's an opportunity to really rethink that and think a little bit more carefully about how do you actually tailor make and reach to people, reach out to people. Perhaps the commercial world has done that more effectively because of a transactional relationship makes that um, a, a very clear um, a, a avenue. But I think as museums, because we are civic in our reach and we think about um, broader publics, we need to think about how we attend to our patrons and our members as distinct from a general public member and how we uh, develop uh, a knowledge base and to to um, service them, but that's it's it's an ongoing thing. And I think the other thing to say is that digital world is evolving also so fast. Um, learning about new softwares, what are the um, what what what's what are the capacities, and that's something as an, as an institution we're very interested in in relation to practice. What are artists doing with it? What are um, designers doing with it? I was quite taken by some of the recent uh, auction sales in June and July. And for example, what Christie's One did and what Sotheby's did. Um, you know, everybody's sort of experimenting in this space, but it, but it does open up the question, are there different ways of doing things online? Are there different ways of engaging with people, maybe even presenting uh, the work you do in a, in a, you know, through technology? In an exciting, new, and and you know, and 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 engaging way. I don't know what you think about that, but I just think that it, it's 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 about the opportunities. It's it's about what you know, and maybe you don't you yourselves don't necessarily have the have the resources to invest um, and and to explore, but but there is an opportunity there, and maybe that's something we should be we you know we should be encouraging. You know, tech startups. I mean, Hong Kong is you know invest Hong Kong, and and it, it, it wants to be a a, a a kind of knowledge innovator, uh, maybe even an an, an idea incubator. Uh, we know Sun Jun is right across the border. We know they're a tech giant, but we we, we should be able to leverage, uh, you know, either on the on the on the hardware side of things, um, but you know, leverage that in connection with our own ideas for maybe how to engage or present, you know whether it's museum work and public engagement or whether it's the commercial side of things in a new way. 
No, but I think that is the most exciting aspect you're describing because I think we are seeing this entrepreneurial aspect where, you know, uh, I mean, as I described earlier, you know, how many people knew about Zoom before ultimately we got went into COVID. So I think there's so many new ways that we are trying to engage clients. But it is that combination, and I do think it's incredibly important to say, is that, you know, there's nothing quite like the physical, you know, uh, conf- you know uh, relationship between, ste- you know, actually standing in front of a work of art, having the presence of a work of art. And I think a large part of what we are, as all of us are trying to, to do, is finding that balance between how do you create the real experience of being, whether it's in a museum, whether it's in an art gallery, whether it's in, a, in an auction house, how do you have that same experience? Uh, and if you can't have the experience of standing in front of the work of art, how do you at least create something which is a augmented experience right. uh, that doesn't take away from necessarily that, that, that amazing thing, that magical experience that has, happens in front of a work of art, but ultimately adds to what you can have. And again, you know, obviously necessity uh, creates opportunity. And I think that's ultimately what's happened in the commercial world. I can I can say that from our our perspective, yes, there is there is you know the the um, relationship to the object is paramount. You know we all we all value that intensely. But we've also begun at Implus to commission digital artwork, and our first digital commission was with the artist Miao Ying, who did a very wonderful piece that's still available online for people to go and see, which is called Digital Detox and using the great firewall in mainland China as a, as a lure to say, well, all of us who are, if you've just overloaded with the digital world, come in and have a digital detox. Um, so, you know, it's, it's good to have that kind of playfulness and a reflection as well in terms of what, what does digital mean to us in our, in our living reality. And, and perhaps I'd say that, in, I mean, yeah, this is a time when, um, you know, we're, we are globally being forced um, uh, to, to kind of adapt to more digital ways of engagement with, with um, you know, here in Hong Kong and across China in particular, I think, I think people are, are more receptive to it, perhaps, than, than anywhere else in the world. Um, and this isn't something that has just happened recently. It's, it's something we've seen um, and experienced over, over you know, some time now. If, if I just think of auction catalogues, for example, nobody in, in China um, you know, wants us to send them the catalogues because you know, they're quite happy just to look at everything on their phone. Um, so you know, it's, it's something which here in, 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 in China, in Greater China, in Hong Kong, um, you know, people just seem to be very receptive to um, and, uh, and, and adapt to very quickly. Um, it, is, it, is, it is that comfort zone, because as you were talking, I remember being in an auction room back in, this is 2016, when uh, watching my Asian colleagues basically communicating with their colleagues through WeChat, basically during a live auction, using their phones, basically not only to show what's happening in the auction room, this is before ultimately see so much of the technology was there, but writing them in real time basically. And there was this, you know, there was an engagement that was possible between someone who was sitting in New York, you know, literally in the live auction and someone who was in, in Greater China. And yet there was this, you know, speed of communication and action and, you know, whether that person bought it, but it was just the ability to see how technology was being used even in just you know a one-to-one communication, which was so different to what we were seeing uh, with our you know with, with our American or European colleagues doing. Sure, 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 sure. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and take some questions from the audience. Um, but the first one actually speaks to an issue that I was going to ask you anyway, which is to think about the future of Hong Kong as an arts hub. Um, you know, it's been a challenging year in Hong Kong, uh, not just because of COVID and pandemic, but also because of the larger political environment and the relationship with China. And so the, war- the question that we have really right off the, right off the uh, well, actually right off the internet is, um, is, you know, what is the future of Hong Kong as an art trading center? Okay, so an arts hub, but also more specifically an art trading center. 
um, given the imposition of the national security law in Hong Kong, which uh, just happened in June. How do you think about that? How do you each position yourselves? Um, obviously, there's a lot that's unknown, uh, even at the university. Uh, our distinguished law faculty is working to um, try and parse the language of the law and really understand its implications. But from an art perspective, art world perspective, from e where each of you sits, um, how do you think about this? How, how will this impact art business, uh, or just arts engagement in Hong Kong? Let, let me start because I'm a public institution, a civic um, arts museum. And, um, and it is early days and we're assessing it. You know, it's, it's only a month in. And, it, and it, in, in, a, in a context that is, um, you know, Hong Kong has always had a very, very uh, strong ability. It's, it's kind of, um, it, the environment here has allowed us to do so much. And, and I think that's, it's on, and we build on that. For, um, for Implus, of course, we have always had a very strong, robust, curator-led approach to all of the work that we do, research and academic um, research and thinking structures, all of that. And we continue to build that. We, we, we don't think that that's, well, at this point, we're certainly not going to say that that's going to stop. That is the basis of our work and that we believe that it, it's the independence of curatorial voices utterly core to the business of the museum. Um, and, you know, I look to the governance of our institutions um, as a way of managing that. And we have, uh, we have our own MPLUS board, but the West Kowloon Cultural District has an ordinance and that ordinance states very, very clearly, and I'll, I'll, I'll read, read it, um, to uphold and encourage freedom of artistic expression and creativity. And our obligations also include, uh, and their statutory obligations, that include the development of new and experimental works in art and culture to enhance and promote excellence, innovation, creativity, and diversity in the arts and in culture. So that's our mandate, and that's what we intend to do. That's, that's our position at this point. Jonathan? Um, yeah, no, so, um, I mean, to Sahana's point, it, it's still early days. Um, and there's been a huge amount of debate and speculation about Hong Kong's future um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a financial centre. Uh, you know, the city is a, a, a city which has been built on trade and commerce. And of course, that includes the, 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 the trade of art as well. Um, but generally speaking, um, people seem optimistic. Um, when it comes to financial an analysts, they uh, most most you know, general consensus is that um, the the newly implemented uh, national security law um, will have limited, if um, well, limited impact on on financial transactions and capital flows. Um, you know, local currency can be freely exchanged with with any international currency here in Hong Kong, um, where money can be sent or transferred to any country around the world. Um, mainland Chinese companies continue to raise funds in Hong Kong. Uh, we've got Jack Ma's Ant Group IPO um, happening soon, for example, which could be the world's biggest ever flotation. Um, so, you know, financially, things look very rosy here. And traditionally speaking, when the financial markets are strong, um, the art market um, is also strong. So from, from, from my perspective, um, I, I remain quite optimistic. But similarly, I think, uh, and you describe it very well, because I think at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, traditionally Hong Kong has been this extraordinary hub and this uh, transactional uh, center. And, you know, it reminds me actually about a lot of the conversations we're, that were had in London about, you know, the, the place of London in the art world in the 90s and when they were going to bring in certain taxes, which ultimately could be uh, against the, uh, you know, the market there. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what was important was that the culture there, first of all, wanted to be uh, an important uh, place within the, uh, the global market. But ultimately, you know, every decision was made understanding the economic impact of it. 
So I think, again, as, as we've said, you know, this is very early days. We haven't really seen any true impact uh, from this, uh, from these, these new uh, uh, guidances. But I think the optimism that you're describing is really what we're seeing, ultimately, uh, that there is the feeling that this is a great place for trade and that it is, you know, historically, but it will continue to be the place where the whole of Asia will come together for whether it is auctions, whether it's private sales, or whether it's any or for museums, ultimately, this is going to be the cultural center. There's another aspect of this question which has to do with creative expression and creative freedom, which is, you know, some galleries are concerned about the, they want to protect their artists. Um, museums, Sahanya, for, for sure, needs to be thinking about the kinds of exhibitions it does. We're all worried a little bit about self-censorship in this respect. In other words, will we not do things that we, we, we should do that would be brave and interesting to do uh, for fear of crossing some invisible red line? And so I guess, do you have any thoughts about that just from the point of view of public engagement? I mean, will we not be able to do exciting, provocative exhibitions because everyone's just too afraid? No, I don't think so. But I think the, the um well, I, I don't know, but I, at this point, I don't think so. Um, because I also want to talk about censorship um, in terms of museums. Um, censorship has been felt by museums across the world um, in, in very different contexts. I, I, I know in Australia, when I was there, the, there was an Andrea Sarano exhibition at the National Gallery of Victoria that in the end had to be <coughs> taken down because of um, a, a whole group of people who objected to it on religious grounds. So, you know, that's a, an act of censorship. There was even more recently at the Guggenheim in New York, the Art in China post 89 show of which M plus loaned a third of that exhibition to New York. And it went on to San Francisco and three works had to be taken down because that exhibition couldn't continue if those works were on display. So the issue of sense, censorship is something that institutions, museums are always having to face and negotiate. Um, and I think this is another instance of thinking about that relationship between your public. We obviously have to, we can't break the law. No, no institution breaks the law. Um, and, you know, we work within the jurisdictions of which we exist. Uh, so I, I just think we need to uh, think carefully about what, what censorship actually means when we are having to practice exhibition making, public programming. But I don't think that we can, uh, we need to feel fettered by that. We can still make the expression, have the conversation and consider what we want to say in an institutional context in terms of programming. I think it's also how artists react to these situations. You know, I, I think mm. we're not just talking about censorship, it's about you know, what yeah. ultimately creates uh, dialogue as much as anything else. And I think what often happens at these times is you know, art becomes richer, art becomes much more pertinent to its times. So I think mm. at any time of crisis, whether it's COVID, whether it's financial, whether it's ultimately political uh, concerns, it does engage artists in a different way. And I think that's another aspect which I find very exciting about, you know, what we're going to see coming out of this period is going to be a very rich, layered aspect in the way that artists are responding to our society. Yeah, I completely agree with what Brett just said. I mean, if you if you look back um, not that long ago, um, you know, not even 30 years ago to, to the early uh, 1990s in Beijing following the Tiananmen Square incident, for example, um, you had a huge amount of um, creativity coming out of, of, of mainland China with the, the so-called cynical realist artists, the likes of uh, Zheng Fanzhu, Yue Minjun, uh, Zhang Shaogang, for example. And um, that, that period lasted 15 years. Um, in terms of huge amount of um, creativity, and so so yeah, but what happened? This, as we say, this is this is you know, early days, and so the, you know, the coming years ahead are going to be, I, I predict, quite exciting in terms of artistic expression here in Hong Kong. Yeah, I think, and 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 in the region, and I and I know because we have the Sig collection, which has you know the authoritative kind 
um, uh, collections of contemporary Chinese art, of which that period is one of, it, it dates back to the early 70s. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the history making that's happening. The, the, you know, it, uh, maybe this is a dimension of the, of the same topic, maybe not, but um, Phil, um, Jonathan, both Phillips, uh, you as well as Christie's are tying up for, you know, for your next auctions with some of the largest mainland uh, auction houses. So for example, you're um, tying up with Polly and Christie's with China Guardian. Um, I'm not suggesting that's a political uh, move, but I wanted you to comment on that because it is interesting, the timing of that. Is that just, uh, 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 just an opportunity that you'd like to explore? What, what would you say about that? Polit politics has got nothing to do with this whatsoever. Um, the, the reason why we're doing this um, essentially is now is because we feel the time um, has come um, for us to establish a a larger foothold within the greater China market. Um, and, um, you know, Poly is the leading auction house in mainland China um, with the longest operating history there. They have a, a, a very large client base there um, and you know, a large infrastructure on the ground in terms of um, you know, offices, staff, um, etc. Um, we, with this collaboration, are able to tune into that immediately at the flick of a switch. Um, you know, and you know, we we will be advertising and building our brand presence in China via their infrastructure, just as they will be, um, you know, reaching out to um, our more global um, client base in order to build their international um, brand and, and global uh, brand recognition. I think community is, 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 is really a very important word. I mean, we, we started by talking about the sort of the ecosystem that exists. And I think that, you know, even in the, in a, you know, COVID in a way has accelerated some of these things. But I, I notice how we as a gallery, as an international gallery, are working alongside the local galleries. What, you know, how do we actually strengthen uh, the community and I think it's the same thing here. It's basically looking at ultimately as a, as a gallery How are we extending our footprint but at the same time? How are we also working within the community? Yeah um, No, I think this is uh, this is such an um, a, a Really timely and interesting issue and in it because it is actually about engagement and and it is about broadening uh, one's audience and one's collector base and as you say we're, we're, we're such an important node uh, in this whole region uh, that it only makes sense um, to further strengthen our ties with, um, you know, with, with art lovers in mainland. There are a lot of questions coming in. We've touched on many of them uh, already, um, but there are, um, there are a lot. Here's one that's a little bit different. Um, what do you think corporates, uh, so MNCs, but also POEs in Hong Kong can do to help the art scene flourish? So and it's timely in a way because there's sometimes there are, there, there, you know, I mean, whether we're talking about private funding or corporate funding uh, concerns, given the current environment about that, some sensitivity maybe around the kinds of activities that corporates have done before, but not to make it a political question, what do you think corporates could do more of to help the art scene flourish here in Hong Kong, which again helps all of us? From a totally selfish museum point of view, um, you, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's very, it's very interesting to see where philanthropy and um, patronage sits in Hong Kong. It's, it's very developed in health in education sectors, but cultural philanthropy is still very early and that extends into the corporate sector as well. And it's, I, I think it's really important that corporate citizenship is extended into the cultural space, whether it's funding artists works through commissions or supporting museums to commission artists to make things. Um, I think it's really important because that's when you know, that ecology really starts to develop. We've seen the development of the market. We're starting to see museum and major institutional development, but it also needs that relationship with philanthropy, collectors, corporates coming into the, the space as well, whether it's working on a prize, support prizes. You know, there are many ways that the corporate sector can help. And I think especially now, 
it's artists who are really finding it hard to survive and especially in performing arts space actually because they are there's very little opportunity to earn your living so i think it's it's a, a key part of support to go right to that that heart to support the makers we none of us would be doing the work that we're doing in cultural space space if the makers weren't making i mean they are really a key part of the ecosystem and especially in a city like hong kong right? so especially way, you almost call upon them yeah maybe more fervently uh, than we might otherwise. Um, certainly long traditions of this exist in Europe and in, and, in, and in North America without question. I mean, I mean many museums and galleries and, and uh, the local art community are, are supported by whether corporate or private sponsorship. And I think maybe that's also part of the learning curve, right? To help them mm -hmm. understand what's really at stake because what's at stake is, is really much larger. It's not simply a um, an investment with a short-term payoff, but it is actually, um, you know, fertilizing, you might say, the ecosystem, that kind of support. Yeah. I think, that, you know, one of the things which has been a major characteristic in Asia has been the, the notion of the private foundation, you know, patronage coming from a private individual versus necessarily obviously supported by state, but it is something which has been a major factor when we think about the Long Museum, or you know, many, many institutions which ultimately have been created on the back of one individual or one family. And I think it is that combination of private patronage and how do you ultimately encourage that, uh, because that obviously is the most important support system that often is behind a museum. It is an individual. Yes, that's right. And then, you know, the add-on of that is basically is the acceptance or at least the state supporting that and allowing for whatever the, the tax advantage is potential for, for doing that. Because I think, again, if we look at ultimately the growth of the infrastructures that we've seen in Europe and America, it has been through pipe, private patronage, but supported by uh, governments that ultimately saw, uh, you know, the giving, of, giving towards the art institutions as something which had tax benefits uh, for those individuals. And I think that's something, again, you know, where we saw, uh, you know, actually some museums specific in America, uh, losing uh, some of that patronage was because of change of laws in terms of taxes. So again, I think it is about, you know, again, it's an ecology. It's basically how do you ultimately have balance all these things at once. Hong Kong doesn't have a lot of private museums. Do you expect to see more of those? Um, I mean, that's a really yeah, I think, way I think the market market market. problem is space. You know, I think if you talk to, 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 to individuals who had ambition of creating private foundations and private museums, a large part of it is actually just the physical nature of where do you put these spaces yeah. versus in, uh, in, in mainland China where you have obviously much greater opportunity for space. And the cost of that space. Sure. Yeah, sure. exactly. Sure. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. I really want to, um, you know, I want to make sure um, each of my guests has an opportunity to, to add any final thoughts or any closing thoughts. It's been uh, a wonderful hour, but I mean, do you have anything you'd like to leave uh, your audience with before we before we sign off? I mean, I mean, we could talk for another hour. There, there, there are many, yeah. many more things we could talk about. I mean, I, I, I would like to just say for us, for M Plus, when we open next year, for for me, it's really important to think about it as part of the, you know, the return of the city back to its, um, you know full glory um, post virus. I, I just think that we do need to think about life post COVID or, or how we accommodate living with the virus in, into the future. And we do need to have high points. And I just think M, M plus will be one of those key moments next year when we open that it's, a, it's really a, a staking claim for the city as being a key cultural capital. Fantastic. Um, and for me, I mean, just to come back to the, the um, you know, the topic of the original kind of question, um, the title of this conversation, why do art business in Hong Kong really, um, when it comes to Hong Kong, um, you know, if you combine all, it's got a lot going for it. If you combine its free trade status, um, its um, comprehensive legal system, the kind of low levels of corruption here, um, the free port, um, the low tax, 
um, the reliable infrastructure, its strategic position, um, and at, you know, at the gate as as the gateway to China, um, which is fast becoming the world's richest economy. I think um, uh, we can safely say that Hong Kong's future as a as a as an art hub um, is secure for a long time to come. Well, I, I, I totally agree, and I think you know it is this commitment that we are all making uh, as businesses, uh, as part, part of a community to this region. And I think that's ultimately, if I look at ultimately, you know, any decision that we have internally as to what we're doing, it, it's always the notion, how do we bring best to this region? It's not about ultimately bringing a compromise situation or a secondary kind of idea in terms of the art we bring. It's really the premier aspect of a lot of our focus. And I think that is very, very important in terms of what that future is. If you look at the gallery system and how quickly it was grown and you have H. Queen's building, you have the Pedder building, you've got galleries such as ourselves where we have individual spaces, but it is that continuation, you know, throughout lockdown, throughout ultimately, uh, you know, the last year, we have brought and continue to bring the best of the art that we can do to, to the region. We have a whole reveal system. We have major Basquiat paintings currently on, on premises. And I think that is really, you know, if I look at what Philips are doing, or look at what M Plus is doing, it is that total commitment to the region. And I think, as, we, as we've said, you know, as we come th through this and whether we have to live with COVID or whether ultimately this is going to be something that, you know, when the vaccine comes, there is going to be, you know, this will be from the past, but it is the building blocks that we're seeing currently and whether it is moving into technology or whether it's ultimately this community working together in a much uh, more cohesive way. I think that is really the most positive aspect of what we, we are currently experiencing. I think that's a fantastic summary of, um, of really the state of Hong Kong and also just what's going on. I'll just add uh, that it's, it's, I mean, in a way, Brett, it's what you said. It's not just that we're aspiring to do well. We're aspiring to do absolutely world-class work in, in, in what we do. And, and it's for all these reasons, for that shared commitment that I think we're achieving and we're going to continue to achieve um, in, in ways that other cities, you know, can only envy. I think Hong Kong does have something unique about it. I think it has something special. Um, and I think it is absolutely, uh, bar none, um, one of the most exciting places to do business of many kinds, but certainly in the art sector. So I really want to thank you all today for, um, for making the time. Um, Brett, especially, I know you got up really early for this. It's still probably just 7 a.m. <laughs> your time. But, uh, and thank you to our viewers for uh, tuning in. I want to thank Art Power Hong Kong in particular for, uh, you know, for, for helping to put this together. For, I'd like to thank Invest Hong Kong for helping to sponsor today's presentation, Sinclair Arts for helping to manage the communications. Um, but finally, and most importantly, to our speakers for joining us today. So thank you, thank you very much. And I hope to talk to you all again soon. Thank, thank you. you very much.